Hi everyone, uh, Rakesh Karana, Danoff Dean of Harvard College, and I am so delighted to have my wonderful colleague, uh, Evelyn Hammonds, uh, the Barbara Gutman Rosencrantz Professor of the History of Science uh, in the History of Science Department in the Faculty of Art and Sciences, and also a professor of uh, African and African American Studies here at Harvard, and also a good friend and colleague. Uh, welcome, Evelyn. Welcome, thank you. Yeah, well, um, thank you for joining us today um, and really appreciative of, of your time. And so first, I hope you and yours are all doing okay during this very challenging moment. Um, yes, we're all fine, but we're all getting a little stir crazy. I'm glad the weather is getting better. Yes, yeah. Um, it's a good reminder that even in, in such moments that spring uh, is a reminder that there's renewal in life and um, it helps us sort of through these challenging moments. So, um, Evelyn, um, you know, I just, you know, just had been going through your work. Um, you know, I've always been aware of your work. And then I, you know, just reading it again in, in a more recent time, I mean, right at the nexus of disease, race, science, um, revealing the hidden injuries of marginalization and, uh, that lead to structural inequalities. And I was just wondering, how are you thinking about this moment? How are you making sense of this moment as an intellectual, but also as a person who feels these things uh, uh, in, 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 in the world, in, in, in the work, research that you're doing, uh, mm -hmm. the classes that you're teaching? Sure. So um, actually I'm on sabbatical right now, so I'm not <laughs> teaching this term. But of course, like everybody else, I'm following, uh, I've been following the outbreak of the novel coronavirus with great interest. Uh, and it touches, completely touches on uh, many, many aspects of my own work. So the first thing that um, I did, uh, because in our department uh, of the history of science, uh, we do history of medicine, also history of technology as well. So. The first thing we did was set up a listserv for the department on the social history of COVID-19 so that we could start having people post any articles that they found interesting uh, so that uh, going forward, when graduate students begin to write about this or any of us in the department write about what's happening, we will not have, uh, we'll have this sort of reserve, uh, archive of interesting uh, materials to draw from so much is being published right now uh, in blog posts, in podcasts, in uh, uh, mag uh, broad interests, magazine articles, scholarly articles. And so just wanted to try to capture some of that. We're not capturing all of it, but some that people find interesting so that we can use it to reflect upon uh, when we move past this particular moment of crisis. So that's the first thing that, um, that I did. Uh, also, I thought it would be great for the graduate students to focus on something um, outside of their own set of anxieties and concerns and just, you know, use their critical thinking skills uh, that we teach in the department about how you think about uh, the impact of disease um, to, you know, sort of give them some things to, to just sort of uh, ruminate upon uh, right now. And so, uh, so we've done that, and we get we've got we've we've collected a lot of material, uh, including I think I I think uh, images of um, that came out right away of empty streets and towns and cities, um, just to show uh, and remind us of of what has actually happened and the many ways in which you can capture it. Then the second thing is uh, so I'm also director of the project on race and gender in science and medicine at the Hutchins Center here at Harvard. So We've been holding a weekly webinar with historians of medicine, uh, public health experts, historians of public health, um, and um, historians of African and African American history to look at the contemporary and historical aspects of, of the impact of pandemic diseases on African American communities. So we started with a discussion with um, David Williams over at uh, TH Chan School of Public Health here at Harvard, who really presented uh, a, an amazing discussion of health disparities uh, in African-American communities, long-standing health disparities, unfortunately, we have to say, uh, as long as probably two centuries worth. And so 
He gave us a very nice introduction to health disparities, a lot, a lot of data, followed by um, Professor Rana Hogarth, who's a, a associate professor of history at the University of Illinois Champaign, who wrote about the 1793 epidemic of yellow fever in Philadelphia and how that impacted the black community uh, uh, in the colonial period. And then followed by Jim Downs of the University of Connecticut, who talked to us about smallpox epidemic that broke out at the end of the Civil War that had an enormous impact on the newly freed population. And then uh, Vanessa Gamble, who's a historian at, and physician at George Washington University, who talked to us about um, the influenza 1918, which a lot of people have written about, but not many people have talked about its impact on African American communities, which was, which was also uh, devastating in part because the structural inequalities that have deeply been embedded in our society by this point. And then yesterday, we had a great talk with Paul Farmer, who of course has spent a lot of time working on these kinds of outbreaks from um, multiple drug resistant tuberculosis in Haiti to Ebola, to uh, malaria and so many other things. So we had a great talk with uh, Paul yesterday. So even though I'm on sabbatical, I'm on sabbatical, I've been really engaged in uh, trying to keep our focus on some aspects of, of what's happening with the, so, uh, with the pandemic. Thanks, I mean, that's amazing. Um, I just love the idea that, you know, on all these areas, developing an archive to capture what sometimes feels like a fictional moment, but obviously is nonfiction. Uh, the images, the, the 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 vocabulary for the moment, and bringing in our community into doing that and, and doing it across a variety of mediums. I was wondering, you know, with all these scholars that you're talking about, and because it is history of science, and are, I'm not, you know, um, you know, for those of us who are not, you know, uh, that deep into that literature, what would be the two or three threads or constructs that you think kind of hold that? Uh, work together from the range of areas that people are studying that that speak to us today. What should we be aware of? What 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 perspective do, does it you know raise up for us? So one of the things, well, I think one of the first things people uh, ought to be aware of is that whenever there's an outbreak of disease like we have at this particular moment, that is epidemic disease, it absolutely will lay bare any kind of tensions fissures uh, in the social fabric of a community from the top of the community from leadership all the way down to the most marginal. And that should be expected. So for historians of science and medicine right now, almost nothing that has happened is, is a surprise. Mm -hmm. And that's because we know that anytime there are these kinds of, of, of disease outbreaks, the um, the uh, employees, the employers, uh, the, the sector would always say, we shouldn't have quarantines because that's gonna affect the economy. We'll have politicians who say, how, much re how many resources should we bring to bear on bringing this under control? We always will have public health experts who have their own specific set of policies that they think will bring it under control. There will be a public reaction of fear, uncertainty, and anxiety. These are pretty predictable aspects of it. How they manifest themselves in any given society or any given community, history doesn't tell us what we can expect but we know that those aspects of any society will be touched just like it was in H with the um, outbreak of HIV, which is something um, some of our students are certainly old enough to remember aspects of that. But most people don't know what happened in the influenza epidemic in 1918. But you will see this, you will see, uh, you will see certain kinds of reactions coming from certain sectors. Uh, and that's one of the things that we will, that, that studying this helps you to understand. The second yeah. thing that, that I think is one part that, that we're trying to focus on in our webinar series is that in the United States, the, the, the sort of uh, lack of understanding of this history um, tends to obscure something that we believe is very important in the history, in African American history, and that in every outbreak, that we've had that affected deeply of the African-American community. African-American people, leaders, community leaders, religious leaders, political leaders, uh, educators, uh, all kinds of folks 
always rallied to find a way to address, address the outbreak and to support their communities. And that really often gets lost. Uh, so in 1918, for example, it was still a period of segregation. Uh, black people weren't allowed in certain kinds of hospitals, both in the North and the South. And black people opened up their churches, they opened up their homes, they opened up the schools that they had control of, and they provided care for their people. And they were the only people who provided care for African Americans in a systemic kind of way. So to, to reach back to, to emphasize a history of, of African American acti activism and self-help is one of the things we wanted to make visible uh, as we think about what's happening right now. Well, that's just incredible what you've shared. Um, I mean, it's sobering at one level that, um, you know, uh, history provides us this perspective and almost kind of the playbook. When people say there isn't a playbook for this time, there is a playbook for almost how, how often our responses are, uh, how contested they are, uh, uh, that the debates often end up centering on the same sort of issues about, you know, how much and who and when, and yet, uh, we seem to have some challenges in kind of, even with all that great knowledge to actually internalize that and then lead our way out to it. And yet, at the same time, I love what you just said, is that there is leadership that asserts itself. It's, it's from the ground up. It's community-based leadership. Yes. And I guess I, I would ask the question at, at a moment like this, um, what do you go back to personally to kind of renew that sense of hope to think about what communities can do, where do you see hope uh, at a moment like this, and what can we as educators uh, who are educating, you know, the next generation who is, you know, uh, at this moment experiencing this, but also maybe possibly help us lead us out of this, mm -hmm. uh, what, what lessons would you offer, at, both as an educator, as somebody who has been the dean of the college, uh, uh, as, a, as a historian of science and as, as a person who's involved in uh, her own community? So uh, the, the thing that gives me hope is, is really sort of, um, it comes in, in, in two particular respects. And the first is to, uh, to never give up hope and to realize there's always something we can do. The second one is that um, it, this kind of outbreak reminds us that there's some very deep structural inequalities in our society. And, and, and the epidemic has certainly, this pandemic has certainly laid bare what some of those are, but it also has laid bare our failure to truly confront them. And so in, the, in a moment like this, you know, I think about, you know, what kind of work uh, both as an educator, so I think telling these stories and making this history visible is one thing I can do, and I, I'm doing that actively. But there's another step, and that's one of the things that was a, a point that uh, was made yesterday in, our in my conversation with Paul Farmer, that, you know, where can you volunteer? Where can you do something in your own community to help people get out of your own head, get out of your own self, and figure out what you can do for somebody who has less privileged than you do, or to help solve a problem. I mean, one of the things is in my background as an engineer, uh, the motto of many engineers is engineers solve problems. What kind of problems need to be solved in the wake of this outbreak? One of the clearest ones is that Zoom is not the answer. So any of you who have talent in engineering and computer science, now is the time to think about what better ways can we communicate how do you do, take something like a Zoom platform, enhance it, make it more available and easy to use for all kinds of people? What are disabled folks who have some real difficulty with using the program are doing right now? Don't just think about it, do something about it. And if you know how to use the, the all kinds of computer programming skills, put your skills to work to help people. And so those are the things that, that I would, I would really uh, think about emphasizing to students right now, both to learn your history, learn, and that history is really, really important. But secondly, to do something concrete, no matter how small, but to really get outside of yourself and, and uh, think about the bonds of community that we want to strengthen in this moment. Our community uh, among ourselves here at Harvard and, and among our peers and our colleagues but also in your own communities. And I think it's really, really important because if you, if you sit back and don't get involved, 
uh, then we will miss some opportunities that this moment has made possible. Oh, Evelyn, I just can't think of a better way to end uh, this interview on those notes uh, at a moment where it's so easy to turn inward to, uh, uh, you know, and, and say, let me wait this out. And at the same time, a call for all of us, a call for our citizens, citizen leaders, a call for our students, a call for graduate students, a call for our faculty, our staff, is this is the moment we need you to lean in. Um, and and, 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 and it, it, no matter how small, it's going to make a difference. Absolutely will. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Uh, thank you for inspiring me on this day. And thank you for uh, just being such a wonderful colleague. Uh, I'm sure this is not the way you planned your sabbatical uh, and, and had to do so much more work. Uh, so I'm grateful just on behalf of our institution to have such a wonderful colleague like you. Thank you, Rakesh, and thank you for all you do. Goodbye. Bye-bye.